really thank you today for joining me in this uh, short 30-minute webinar to go over the SRS interoperability data platform. And also, I've, tied, I've gotten this down to exactly 30 minutes, and we will have one or two minutes at the end just to show you our ICD-10 um, plans and how we're implementing it, and we've done a lot of work with it, and I think anyone who's seen it really loves it. So I'm very excited about that, and I'm sure you will be too. And we'll definitely squeeze that in at the end of the uh, webinar. So our goal today is to first feel your pain. <laughs> you look at this slide, and we look at um, all the different programs and acronyms that, that are flying around regarding data interoperability. And you know, it starts with HIEs, but there's PQRS, ACOs, HL7, CCD, ICD-10. On top of that, we have Meaningful Use Stage 1 and now Stage 2 coming out in, in the next year. And we have all sorts of programs that are run by the government and payers to measure quality and outcomes and uh, to do uh, benchmarking and predictive analytics. So the question is, is how do we, you know, it used to be you saw patients, they left, and then you'd see your next patient, and they would leave, and, you know, you'd, you'd, have a, you'd do that every day, day in and day out. You don't have to worry about all these things. So at SRS, it's our job, we feel, to worry about all of these uh, uh, disparate programs and all these acronyms, these, these standards, and not only meet the regulations that are out there and the standards, but to, in many cases, exceed them. And I'm going to give you specific examples of how we do a good job at exceeding um, the requirements in the marketplace in the name of productivity and efficiency, which everybody knows is very important and near and dear to both me and SRS and everybody here at the company and all of our clients. Um, but first, you know, I, I'd like you guys to get an understanding of what kind of data are we talking about. So this is an interoperability webinar, but what kind of data are we sharing? And you know, just to just, just to you know, really boil it down, there are six pieces of data, just six categories of data that drives all the quality initiatives. And the first category that they're listed right here is patient demographics. You know, that's expected. But then the five others are drugs, problems and procedures, immunizations, and a catch-all that we call observation. Observations are um, things like, uh, let's take a simple uh, lab result, cholesterol. If your cholesterol is 150, that's an observation. Vital signs, height, weight, blood pressure, you know, even the systolic part of blood pressure would be its own observation or SNOMED code. Um, when you get into uh, orthopedics, let's say, you get into ranges of motion you know, in, your, in your knee or a Harris hip score, that would be an observation, would be a SNOMED code. And when you get into uh, like ophthalmology, you might have um, uh, visual acuity, intraocular pressure, cup to disc ratio, things like that are observations. So, at SRS, we have a very robust data model that handles all these six pieces of data in terms of capturing, displaying it on the screen, and sharing it with other entities, which we're going to go over to going over that today. So there's six pieces of data. If there's no seventh category, uh, I suppose if one came about, I know that I know right now for meaningful use stage two, they're still on the same six categories of data that you see here. If someday they come up with a seventh category of data for stage three or whatever, we will obviously uh, expand our data model to accommodate that seventh category. But right now, and for the foreseeable future, it's these six. And again, these six drive all the programs, you know, e-prescribing, PQRS, meaningful use. They're all driven by these data elements. And just to give you a little color or example, um, we look at um, the different quality measures and clinical decision support rules, which is down here on the left side. And you can see how every single one of these, these sample and basically every one of these clinical quality measures are driven by those six data points. And I'm not going to go through all these, but just the first three. So let's just look at lower back pain. So the measure there is if you have lower back pain, lumbago, that the, you know, the measurement is, is how many of my patients have had um, 
uh, imaging study. So that would be the problem is lower back pain you see on the right side, and the procedures are imaging studies. So you can see two of the six data elements drive that quality measure. We have the beta blockers quality measure. And what's that? We'll start at the bottom here. For all patients over 18, demographic, who have uh, an MI or CAD, coronary artery disease, are they on beta blockers? So that's demographics, problems, and drugs. And we could jump to colorectal screening. We all know that one. We're familiar. Uh, some people more familiar than others that if you're over 50, that's a demographic field or data element. Did you get your colonoscopy? Did you get that procedure? And that, that's a, a quality measurement. And that's based on two of those items. Immunizations, I didn't show you one, but there's one down here. Pneumonia vaccine, so if you're over 62, demographics, have you had your pneumonia vaccine? That's immunization. So you can see how, again, a combination of any one or more of these data uh, elements drive all the quality measures. So you could do a lot of damage, and you know, in a good way, and drive quality and accommodate what's coming down the pipe with payment reform by just tracking and collecting these six pieces of data. So this is a, so now that you get this data, and we collect all these those elements of data in SRS, what do you do with that data? So it's, 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 it's bottled up in, in SRS, and for most all of SRS's history, that data has been bottled up inside the system, and really you could use it for your, your own consumption, or the, you know, the physician or staff could look at that, but not share it with anybody. So what we do at SRS now is we have something called the data hub written right here. So you put all that data as an SRS, and we have two-way interfaces with all these entities, and we'll start with HIEs, where we could send or receive data from a health information exchange. So therefore, you're sharing now with other physicians and uh, uh, providers and hospitals in the community. We have interfaces with labs, um, state agencies. So by the way, this is cloud-based. Our data hub is in the cloud, and we send these six pieces of data um, to, let's say, a, an immunization registry or a uh, syndromic surveillance registry. We send, we could send directly to other practices. Registries, these would be specialty focused or just general uh, type registries that are quality registries we send data to. And hospitals, we have lots of interfaces with hospitals. We get lab results and op reports and discharge summaries. So through our data hub that sits in the cloud, we are able to connect to these various entities, and it's, it's nice. So once we connect to an entity, I'll give you a case study in a little bit, like the NYU Health Information Exchange. Once we connect once through our cloud-based data hub, then it's easier for us to connect all of our clients to that HIE. So that's, that's a little overview about the SRS data hub. And the one thing that's really important that everybody should know right now is the standard w that we use to communicate that data. Um, it's called the CCD. CCD stands for Continuity of Care Documents. And this is an industry standard format that every single vendor who's certified for meaningful use can create and export and import a, a, a standard format file. In this case, this, that we're talking about is the CCD. So just remember that for the rest of the conversation because we're going to be talking about CCD. Uh, it's going to come up a number of times. So I'm going to give you three case studies just to give you a flavor, three different types of uh, data interoperability, data exchange that SRS does um, that will give you a real good flavor for what we're doing to lead the way in interoperability of clinical data. The first example is uh, a company called Obird. And Obird, they do two things. They're a patient portal and they're also an outcomes vendor in the orthopedic uh, area. So we have a client, it's called Rothman Institute, there are 101 or two surgeons in the Philadelphia metropolitan area, and the first problem they had is they have medical staff entering meaningful use data manually, which, you know, slows down the clinic. We like to automate things as much as possible. So they were entering, you know, height, vitals, height, weight, blood pressure, smoking status. So they were using a portal called Obert, and they said, well, can't the patients put this data on the portal? And then we could write it into your database, these elements. And we said, 
Well, that doesn't sound too scalable, right? I mean, if you're going to connect directly to every one of our clients' database and write data in, then what happens if we change something on our end? It's going to kind of mess things up. Then your, your interface won't work anymore. So we said, well, tell you what, Ober. Send us a CCD file. Remember I talked about a CCD. And the CCD file will contain, remember those observations we were talking about? Will, will contain all those observations, the, the height, weight, the blood pressure, if the patient self-reports, and also the um, uh, smoking status of the patient, you know, former smoker, active smoker, every, uh, everyday smoker, stuff like that. So they sent. The, so what they do now is, uh, since last August, so it's coming up now in, in a year, at the tune of about, at the rate of about 450 patients a day, go into the portal, put these discrete data elements into their portal record. As soon as they click Save, Obert sends us a CCD with this discrete data. And we put it in our database. And we map it to the field and put it in our database. So for those 450 patients, every day, there's no medical staff that needs to manually put that information in. So you know, that's, that's obviously very uh, effective. And the big takeaway here is it's not a requirement of meaningful use, right? Meaningful use just says you have to take a CCD and display it on the screen so you could see what the smoking status is, but not input it into our database to meet like meaningful use requirements. So it's that automation of getting uh, discrete data and automating the input of that into our database that's uh, the real time saver. It's kind of like the barcode engine we have. You know, the barcode automatically routes documents into patient into the tabs in the patient's chart. Well, here we automatically route clinical data and put discrete clinical data into the patient's chart. So it's very SRS-like to, to want to do something like this. And again, it's above and beyond what meaningful use requires. Um, the second thing that we did is uh, this practice, uh, Rothman Institute, they see about 3,000 patient encounters a day. So it's just a tremendously busy practice. And they were printing out 3,000 of those patient care summaries for meaningful use and handing them to the patient every day. That's a tremendous amount of paper. 3,000 sheets of paper is basically six reams of paper. So it's 15,000 pages a week times four weeks a month. It's 60,000 pages a month times 12 months. But about three quarters of a million pieces of paper that they were printing out every single year to give to the patients to meet that meaningful use requirement. So Obert said, well, we would like to go into your database and pull out the data. And then the patients will, will have been, quote, delivered that clinical data, and they don't have to print it out, right? They meet that meaningful use measure. Well, we said, well, we don't want you going in our database, but what we're going to do is we're going to, we have an engine that we've built that we hired, um, I like to equate it to elves, you know, little green elves that in the middle of the night, they come out on our server, and they put together, in this case, in Rothman's case, they put together 3,000 CCDs in the middle of the night and we export those CCDs to, oh, through our data hub in the cloud, and we export it to OBIRD. So now all of those, all that discrete clinical data is now posted with OBIRD and posted to the patient's chart so that they don't have to print out those sheets of paper. Um, again, just to make the point, remember before data import, automated data import and, and databasing discrete data in our database is something that's over and above meaningful use requirements. This too, meaningful use only requires that you have to click a button and save a CCD to the hard drive, to the C drive or a, you know, a, a thumb drive. What we do is we've automated that process and went way above and beyond the requirements by creating 3,000 a night in this case and sending it off to another entity. Um, so if you look at the slide, you can see at the bottom the, the benefit is just a tremendous time saving. No more data enter, no more data entry of discrete data, and no more printing out of uh, clinical care summaries. So the second case study, this one's a nice, a fun one. It's called Wellcentive. So Wellcentive is a quality registry. And what they do is they, um, well, let me back up. This is a client of ours, Pine Medical. So Pine Medical is a primary, mostly a primary care group. There's 23 doctors, um, a few multi-specialty doctors in the practice, but mostly primary care in western Michigan. And in western Michigan, the blues are a very um, uh, powerful, you know, large payer. They're the 800-pound gorilla of the payers up there. And they have a ton of incentive programs that the practices could join um, 
you know, provide discrete data, and then they get incentives for being measured on their quality. So they weren't participating in all the incentive programs because it was quite labor intensive. But for the programs they were participating in, the nurses at the practice were spending, there's 11 nurses, the nurses at the practice were spending one to two hours every day inputting discrete clinical data, not only into SRS, but then again into the registry. So what we did is we wrote a, uh, an interface where in the middle of the night, remember those green elves we were talking about, they come out and Pine Medical sees about 500 patients a day, 500 encounters. We create 500 CCDs and we send it through our data hub to Wellcentive. And Wellcentive, if you go to their website, they do all sorts of neat healthcare data analytics. They do quality measurement, uh, outcomes analysis, benchmarking, population management, predictive analytics, um, the whole nine yards. And because they're able to do that and do all this measurement, um, the practice, Pine Medical, was able to realize a fourfold increase in their incentive payments. And according to Marge Young, who's uh, one of the administrators at the practice, when we went live with this, they said it was one of the it was the best day of their nurses' lives. And you, that was a direct quote. And you could just imagine just wiping clean all of that manual data entry so they could focus on patients. Um, so this kind of quality measurement is is prevalent in primary care. Special specialists are I I wouldn't say light years, but several years behind. Uh, the primary care uh, in terms of this kind of analysis and, and data analytics. It's coming. I know cardiology, Heather, you're on the phone. I know the Pinnacle Registry has been around for several years, but if you look at like ophthalmology, they're about 18 months away from having a, a, you know, an AAO, American County of Ophthalmology sponsored registry. Orthopedics, um, they're a little bit farther behind ophthalmology. They're just kind of, the AAOS is just getting off the ground with their uh, registry for data and analytics. So, you know, the, the, the nice thing is, is that since we have a, a nice cadre of primary care clients, we are years ahead of the specialists in terms of data interoperability and analytics, um, like this well of type of work that we're doing. And so when it comes to the specialty marketplace, we will be there uh, for you. We're ready. We have all the pieces in place, and we have some nice uh, uh, automated processes to get the data from your practice to the registry. So the third and last case study is the uh, NYU Health Information Exchange. Um, this is a really neat health information exchange. It's um, in the New York metropolitan area. There's uh, something called, if you see there in the middle of the screen, NYCLIX. NYCLIX is a um, New York clinical information exchange. It connects physicians and hospitals and healthcare providers throughout the New York metropolitan area. Well, NYU has something called the UPN, it's the University Physicians Network, UPN. And the UPN, uh, basically every NYU doctor is a me member of the UPN, and it, it behooves the doctor to be a member of the UPN and maintain the membership because UPN negotiates very favorable payments on the doctor's behalf from, uh, from all the payers, and they also provide other uh, nice services. So that when the UPN said, you can maintain your membership of the UPN only if you connect to the NYU HIE. You could imagine that all the doctors were very concerned, and we have 26 NYU physicians who are SRS users across six different practices, and they wanted us to hook into the HIE. To date, there's 60 some odd vendors that have been identified by the NYU UPN that connect to the HIE. Um, less than 20% of those vendors actually connect, and we just we're just actually doing our first implementation. We got full certification with NYU HAE. I think we might have, today might even be the go live day. I hope I have um, more to report my next webinar. Um, but it's a very, very robust health information exchange. Let me just go to a, um, a data sheet that we have here and show you on the data export side. So th these are all the items that we export, the discrete data items that we export to the HIE. So we export demographics, problems, procedures, metallurgies, medications, immunizations, vital signs, smoking status, labs, and encounter information such as appointment type, date, time, doctor, description, location, and the source of the data. We also export radiology reports, progress notes. We have a little engine that converts the Word documents that are exam notes to convert them to PDF files. 
and then sends them to the Health Information Exchange. So it's nice to see where SRS sits. We export all this data, but if you look at what meaningful use requires, they only require these data elements. So again, this is another example of SRS going way above and beyond anything that meaningful use has required uh, you know, to, provide that, to provide that to the HEs. Same thing on the data import side. Let's quickly go to this slide here, where we, we export the continuity of care, the CCD, sorry, import. We need to just import and display that in the software. But at SRS, not only do we do that, but we import all these discrete data elements, right? Vitals, problems, inbound labs, radiology reports, discharge summaries, hospital admittance notifications. These are all through the NYU HIE. Patient consent. What we don't uh, import now, and we will have by the next version, the year end, is drugs and allergies, procedures, family history, and immunization. So again, none of these are required by meaningful use, but we do it because we feel it's important to the productivity of a practice to be able to import discrete clinical data, not just display it, but put it in the chart so you save, you save time of the medical staff doing that. So that's an NYU case study. So where are we going this year? We have, let me just check the time. We have another seven minutes. We're right on time. Where are we going in 2013? We're about a third the way, in, no, a quarter of the way into the year. We've gotten a lot done, and we have a lot more to do. Uh, first, we have um, a new data center. We have an 8,000-square-foot development center that we just built upstairs in our, in our building, and it houses all developers. We have 51 developers with six more um, with six more in the budget, so that'll put us near 60 developers. So when we look when we look at what we're doing this year, one of the first things we're doing, and actually we've written this and it's completed. I have a screenshot for you. Is data discrete data reconciliation? So what is that? Well, let's look at this screen here. Okay, this is a really neat screen. So it looks kind of like a lot of SRS screens, but it's totally different. It has different function. What it does is it is a one-stop shop when data comes from another entity and comes into the SRS chart before we input it into the chart, just willy-nilly put it into the database, we have a place where you reconcile that data against what's already in the paper, patient's chart. So here, and this is all developer, you know, like, like a, here's a diagnosis of what's up 2444. It's just developers playing around, but you get the idea that here's a diagnosis section. These four have SRS logos next to them, so it's already in the chart. These four items have a yellow light, which means they've come from another source, right? It might have come from a HIE. It might have come from a primary care physician in the, uh, in, in the neighborhood, you know, in the community. But you have these four data elements. You compare it to the patient. You, you interview the patient. You compare it within the patient's chart. And then I can click this checkbox here. And all these green, green pluses, they light up. So I could either green light the data, I could, put, I could red light the data here, I could click on the minuses and get, you know, reject the piece of data. And once I've either accepted or rejected all the data elements, I click Save, and it inputs it into the chart. That's called data reconciliation. Again, not a requirement of meaningful use. Um, most of the small vendors don't have this. Many of the very large vendors, the household name vendors that you've heard, they don't have this. But we feel it's really important because we, we have a vision here at SRS that the data that you're going to get into your system, you're going to get a lot of data for, into your system. And it's going to come from, if you're a specialist, it's going to come from the primary care physician. You know, as much as patients can put data in the system, the real authoritative complete record of a patient's health comes from the primary care physician. So to the extent the primary care physician can send the CCD to the, to the, to the specialist, that's rich, that has a payload of discrete clinical data, put it through our reconciliation screen, we could easily database that data into that clinical data into the SRS chart. So we have the discrete data reconciliation come in and we get that data into the chart. And that's a big project that we're working on this year. We're actually done with that, so we could check that off the list. We're going to expand the discrete data import. So we go here, we go down to um, data import, these items here, the drugs, allergies, family procedures, and immunization, okay? Those are going to be especially helpful for specialists because specialists see 25, 35 percent new patients. So if we could get data from the HAE or the primary care doctor for all our new patients, it will just take off a load of work on the uh, clinical staff in our specialist office. Then we have something that's really neat. I think that's game-changing. It's called direct messaging. It's a new protocol 
that is part of stage two certification. That'll remember the CCD I was talking about. It'll let you literally email it right out of SRS or from another practice into SRS using email protocols. Uh, right from SRS, using email protocol, send the CCD to another doctor. Kind of like you could send a prescription to a, the, 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 the um, you know, sure scripts, they, they provide a list of pharmacies, a, a directory of pharmacies that are part of the network. Well, you have a directory of um, primary care physicians, let's say, or primary care physicians will have a directory of specialists, and they could send back and forth CCDs. So I, I think it'll sharply reduce the you know the referral process there'll be you know that'll be paperless and the intake process and you know you'll get the discrete data into SRS plus the whole consult letter you just send a CCD and you'll send that to the primary care physician through this direct protocol so we're looking forward to pro providing that and then there's the mini portal um, the mini portal is a uh, uh, you know we have a full blown portal but there's going to be a, a mini portal which allows you it just meets the meaning for use requirement which allows you to provide uh, patient care summaries to the patient so you don't have to print them out anymore, and also allows the patient to communicate with the physician's office. They could do um, uh, you know, questions about bills, about their health care. That's also part of stage two meaningful use and is a requirement. So we're working on that. And that's going to be free. That mini portal, not the full service portal, but that mini portal will be um, part of your, your, your next SRS upgrade when we get the stage two certification. So that's a little bit about our roadmap. There's a lot more stuff, but those are the core items. So we're, we're now done with the webinar. Uh, ended just on time. It's 3 o'clock. So if you have another two, three minutes, I could show you how we're going to handle ICG-10. Um, and you could, again, feel free to raise your hand or ask any questions that you want, and, and we can answer those questions.